If you don't know what shaders are, here's a quick introduction to get you started. This is a deep topic, there's a lot to say about it, but at the basic level, a shader is a program you use to do shading. More precisely, you use it to modify the geometry or the pixels that get drawn on screen. When I say geometry, it's the vertices that make up a 3D mesh. In Godot, you write shaders using a simple language that's specific to Godot. It's similar to GLSL, the OpenGL shading language. It's a bit simpler, but also similar to C in the syntax. You can see how we have to specify the type of the variable, like the vector 3 here, and we append a semicolon at the end of every statement. So with shaders, we can do uh, an infinite amount of effects, really. You use them to do post-processing, to do normal mapping, so lighting, uh, to add bumpiness to objects, to draw a character's outlines. You can see that on the left. You can uh, generate textures. You can see that on the right with one of those uh, Voronoi shaders. You have the Water 2D example in the center by Godojo, Jet Stevens. There's no real limit to what shaders allow you to achieve. And I have a clever example from Alchemy Studio. They made a hack and slash and shoot them up mix that's called Drifting Land. And they are using two textures. One represents an effects in and out animation. The next one is a gradient map on two axes. So kind of a gradient box. And they use a shader to animate the texture like you can see on the bottom left, so they create a mask. They then color that mask over time with, with the gradient textures x-axis. And with the gradient on the y-axis, they shade the mask that they draw on screen, giving you the effect you can see on the right. They've documented the process, so you can find the link in the description. There are three types of shaders you'll use in Godot. The first one is called the vertex shader. You use that to modify the object's vertices, the geometry. This not only works on 3D meshes because everything is rendered to polygons. So you can use that to skew a 2D polygon or to modify their shape to animate them over time. You can do fragment shaders. These sample and process the pixels inside your texture. You use that to do post-processing, to apply filters, in a sense. And then there's the light shader. This one, you use it to interact with the lighting system, both in 3D and in 2D. It gives you access to some values that are specific to lighting. And you can build a custom lighting model. For example, if you wanted to do a tune or cell shading, that's where you would build it. The program that you write is going to run once for every single vertex on the object. So that's for the vertex shader. It's generally not too heavy. The fragment shader or the light shader are going to run once for every single pixel. This means that the larger your game's resolution, the more resource intensive shaders become. They will run only on the pixels of the sprites of the object it attaches to. So you can apply a shader to the entire screen and then you'll apply it successively to every single pixel in there, but also on a single sprite or on a variety of sprites. Instead of X and Y, when it comes to sampling textures, we talk about the U and V coordinates. You will find them and use them all the time in shaders, so you'll want to learn about them. U and V are values between 0 and 1 and the shader is going to use them to find pixels inside the texture. A sprite or a texture, you can scale it on screen. So the pixels on the original texture don't necessarily match the pixels on the scaled texture. You use the U and V coordinates to sample the pixels when you scale the sprite up and down. You should also know that shaders run on your graphics card so they don't hit your CPU too much. They have a limited set of instructions. You cannot write complex functions or classes or anything like you would in GDScript, for example. Fairly low level, you have a limited set of instructions that you have to creatively use together to create a filter or a certain effect. Here we are in the editor and you can see how shaders run in the viewport, even if you're not testing the game. These are compiled programs, so they will also recompile automatically, you don't have to bother. 
I have one sprite. To apply a shader to it, we have to go down the inspector, down to the canvas item object and the material parameter. You'll want to create a new material when you add a sprite and you will apply the shader to that material, be it a 2D object or a 3D object. Using the arrow to the right of the material, you can enter the resource. When you do that, you will see a shader item pop up and that is where we will create the canvas item shader. There are two ways to do it in Godot 2. If you create a canvas item shader, you will have to code it by hand. And if you use the second option, you will use a graph. You can do it in a visual way. I'll show you that. That way you don't have to write all the instructions by hand. We're going to use the other option. I invite you to create a new canvas item shader. The visual system will be dropped temporarily. It has to be remade, so it will probably, it will probably be available in Godot 3.1. Shaders are simple programs. You don't write so many lines of code, so it's often faster to just code it by hand that way. When you enter the shader resource, the shader object, a new tab opens or docks at the bottom of the viewport. And there you can find three sub tabs, the vertex, fragment, and lighting ones. These correspond to your vertex shader, fragment shader, and lighting shader we mentioned just before. We'll click on the Fragment tab because we want to work on the object's pixel and let's start to talk about variable types. Everything is typed in this language, so you will have to write the type of variable you want to create. The basic ones are booleans, which can be equal to true or false, or you have the floating point values. Uh, there's no integer in shaders, only floating point values between 0 and 1. To get your current textures color, so the sprite the shader is attached to, you will use the color variable. This is a built-in one and it's of the type vector4 or color. Vector4 and color are the exact same thing. But you have to write it in all caps to get your textures color. This color value is used both as an input and as an output. That is to say you can get the pixels from your sprite using this variable. You can modify them and then you can reset the color variable to something different to modify the color of your texture. Let's do that. We're going to create a new vector4 or a color object. You construct that just like you would with vector2s for example in GDScript and we'll enter floating point values inside of it. We need four because there's the red, green, blue, and alpha channels. So let's type 1.0 for all of them. At the end of the instruction, we have to add a semicolon and wait for a few moments for the program to recompile. So this program means that for every pixel on the texture, Godot is sampling all the pixels one after the other. We change the color of the pixel to pure white at full opacity. If we change the last value, the alpha, 2.5, we'll get a half transparent color. Let's do something a tiny bit more exciting. We're going to replicate the multiply blending mode. Multiply is called that way in graphics editing programs because we multiply the color by an other. Because colors are always stored in values between 0 and 1, when you multiply it by anything below 1, it's going to darken the color. Let's create a new float variable called uh, multiply, and we'll set it to something below 1, 0.5 for example. Output color is going to be equal to color times the multiply vector add a semicolon, and we effectively multiply all the color channels by 0.5, darkening the image. Because we also multiply the alpha, the image is getting a bit more transparent. We want to only multiply the RGB values of the color vector. You can swizzle or access the subcomponents of a vector or a variable by typing the channel names. For a color, you have R, G, B, and A in that order. Or you can also use X, Y, Z, and W instead. If I do that, it's the exact same thing as typing just color times multiply. 
Now we want to output a color, so we still have to rebuild a color and to retain the original alpha. To do that, we're going to access the RGB channels of the color and multiply them by the multiply value. And we're going to append the color's original alpha value at the end as the fourth component of the color vector. And now we are just darkening the pixels and we don't affect the opacity of our texture. Now we can go one step further than that and access the multiply value from outside the shader. To do that, you have to use the uniform keyword before you declare the variable. It doesn't change anything aside from the fact that now we have access to it inside the canvas item material. Below the shader, you'll find the shader parameters. And our parameter is called multiply. And when we change it, you can see how the shader updates in real time. As with any parameter, we can access it from GDScript and using the set method, we can set it from the code. We can also animate our effects, our shaders over time using the time value provided by Godot. There again, it's in all caps because it's a value passed in by Godot itself. We'll use it to animate our textures alpha. We'll declare a floating point variable called alpha and we'll set it to time. If we set it to time alone, let's um, append it inside our color vector. It's not going to help us a lot. The alpha is going to grow beyond 1.0 and keep growing over time. Now to keep a value between zero and one, we can use a sine or cosine function. These are provided along with some basic mathematical functions. Let's use the sine of time. A sine function will always return a value between minus one and one. We'll also multiply the resulting value by our initial alpha, so we retain the object's transparency. Now, because a sign can go down to minus one, we have to add one to it, and we'll also have to divide the result by two. If we add one to a function that has limits between minus one and one, it's going to be limited between zero and two. If we divide that by two, we'll get a value between zero and one. Now, if you want to accelerate or slow down the effect, we'll have to multiply the time by something inside your trig function. If we multiply the time by two, the alpha will oscillate two times faster. And if we multiply it by 10, it's going to go 10 times faster. Here are some of the basics. There's a lot to say about shaders, so we'll come back to them later, but hopefully you understand a tiny bit more how they work. If you want to go a bit further, I invite you to read the book of shaders. I put a link in the description. It's going to explain a bit more about how shaders work, how to manipulate colors and all that stuff in a general setting, not just in the context of Goto. Aside from that, you also have the documentation and you have two or three demos inside the official demos that are dedicated to shaders where you can go read the code and learn a bit more about how to achieve certain effects.